verses 12 through 27. Then the band and the captain and the officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him and led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. Now Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. And Simon and Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. That disciple was known unto the high priest and went in with Jesus into the place of the high priest. But Peter stood at the door without, then went out that other disciple, which was known unto the high priest, and spake unto her that kept the door, and brought in Peter. Then saith the damsel that kept the door unto Peter, Art thou not thou also one of this man's disciples? He saith, I am not. And the servants and the officers stood there, who had made a fire of coals, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves, and Peter stood with them and warmed himself. The high priest then asked Jesus of his disciples and of his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I spake openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple, whither the Jews always resort, and in secret have I said nothing. Why ask thou me? Ask them which heard me what I have said unto them. Behold, they know what I have said. And when he said this thus spoken, one of the officers which stood by struck Jesus with an open palm of his hand, saying, Answerest thou the high priest so? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil. But if I, well, why smitest thou me? Now Annas had sent him bound unto Caiaphas the high priest, and Simon and Peter stood and warned himself. They said therefore unto him, Art thou not also one of his disciples? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, being his kinsman, whose ear was cut, Peter cut off, saith, Did not I see thee in the garden with him? Peter then denied again, and immediately the cock crew.
John chapter 18. In introducing today's passage, we must recall last week's message on absolute surrender. Jesus went forth focusing on how Jesus displayed total submission to the Father's will in the moments leading up to his arrest. And we saw uh, that Jesus went forth, first of all, devotionally. As you remember this in verses 1 through 3, Jesus approached his impending suffering with devotion, engaging in prayer in the garden, aligning himself with the Father's will, even as he anticipated betrayal. So he went forth devotionally, but do you remember also he went forth willingly? Jesus knowingly went forth to meet his captors, displaying his willingness to surrender and to fulfill God's plan. And even when faced with the intimidating forces of the Roman soldiers, as well as the priest of the temple, he went forth willingly to do that for you and me. Also, we saw he went forth vicariously. What do you mean? He went forth and he took the disciples and set them apart so they wouldn't get it hurt. He went forth before us and gave himself a ransom so that you and I wouldn't have to go to the cross and die for our own sins. He did that for you and me. And finally, Jesus went forth, we saw purposefully, purposefully. He had a purpose to do what he'd been called to do. And despite Peter's attempts to defend him with a sword, Jesus corrected Peter submitting to the cup the father had given him. Jesus was intent on fulfilling the mission he came to accomplish. So today, as we go through 12 through verse 27 of chapter 18, you need that in context so you know where you're at. And as we get closer here and we shift from Jesus's willing surrender to observe his faithfulness under trial and Peter's tragic denial, you're going to see the total opposites of two. You're going to see Jesus Christ being totally faithful in the face, in the face of danger, in the face of failure, but you're also going to see Peter's denial. And everybody here, whether you go to church or not, or whether you've been in church or not, you've heard of Peter and you know about Peter and him denying Christ. Everybody seems to remember everything that happens to us negatively, correct? I mean, very few know good things that we do, but well, we do one thing bad and they never forget it. Well, poor Peter, that's the way it goes for Peter. But I want you to understand today, as you're here and as you're listening, every single one of us, you can start up here at Shayla, you can go all the way back to Josiah and go back in the foyer, you count everybody here, we have all denied Christ once at least in our life. And what I want you to walk away from is this. Peter in his denial, Jesus showed grace and he showed mercy. And Peter came just as the song they just sang, just as he was a denier of Christ, he came and he repented. And Jesus as you remember, said, go feed my sheep. In other words, Peter, I forgive you. Now go about what I've called you to do. And Peter did. So I want you to understand this. There is great hope for you if you're here this morning and you say, man, I have blown it big time. Well, friend, just understand this. If no one else has blown it, I have. So you and me are just close together. And we can just encourage one another, and we can see that God will forgive. And he wants us to face all of our temptations, all of the things that we face in life. He wants us to face it with victory and not failure. And so we'll recall that. And as you go through life and as you go through even this week, and the things that you come against and the things that you face, just remember those two things, Jesus' trial and Peter's denial. Remember, Jesus did the perfect thing and gave the perfect example. Peter, on the other hand, did the wrong thing, gave the wrong example. But understand, you and I can do exactly what Jesus has called us to do, and we can have victory. So we're done. 
Say, well, we're done? Okay, well, we're done. Well, let's, let's dive in and see what the text says and tells us this morning as we look. Faithfulness in the face of failure, Jesus' trial, and Peter's denial. Number one, as you take notes, the captivity of Christ. The captivity of Christ. The first thing we see is the arrest. The arrest. Jesus is bound and led by the Roman soldiers and the Jewish authorities. Verse 12 says, Then the band and the captain and officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him. See, the body of the Son of God was bound that our souls might be loose from the cords of sin and the cords of Satan. That's why he gave his life for us. And he wants us to understand that his submission shows his willingness to fulfill the Father's will despite knowing that suffering awaits him. Even in the face of everything going on, he still submitted to God's will and he knew what was coming. He knew what was coming. And yet he decided to continue to submit. This is an interesting multitude that's arresting him. Understand this. You remember, we said this, there's a thousand soldiers there. This isn't like five or six soldiers and they've come to arrest him. No, there's a thousand that come. And so they have come uh, and they're going to arrest him. And these soldiers and these people that are there arresting him are made up of different people. You have Gentiles, you have Jews, you have heathen, and you have religious, you have soldiers, you have servants, you have priests, you have Pharisees, a whole lot of different types. And though they may not all have things in common, there was one thing that they all had in common. And that they are totally blind to the, incarable, uh, the incomparable qualities of the very Son of God. They were blind to who he literally was. And he'd given them every warning of who he was. They come, you remember? And he says, oh, by the way, who are you looking for? And you remember that? Yeah, we're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. That's who we're looking for. And you know, that was a poke. They were poking him. And he said, here I am. And what they do? They went back. Watch this. All thousand of them went back on their backs and fell down and had to get back up. So he's telling them, hey, I am God in the flesh. I am the son of God. I'm exactly who I've said I've been, and you're not believing me. Some of you here today, some of you here today has not received Christ as your Savior yet. And some of you say, man, if I'd been there, there's no doubt. I would say, hey, man, this guy's real. This is who he is. Do you know he's real even today? He's not changed at all who he is. Scripture tells us he's the same yesterday, today, and guess what? Forever. And he doesn't need to change because why? He's perfect. And so he's come and he's telling us, I am coming again. I'm coming again. And I want you to be ready when I come again because why? I'm coming for those who put their faith and trust in me. And I love you. He's proven that over and over again, and time after time he does. And he's not changed his message to us at all. I love you, and I've done something about it so that you can join me where you and I need to be, in that place called heaven. So he is very clear, and he gives the picture here so that the arrest proceeds, and Jesus is led bound to the high priest of Israel for a Jewish trial. Now hear me, okay, because I want you to get the context, and you'll understand this. There's some things that you have to be clear on to be able to understand what's going on here. The rule of law in Israel was a two-part system. We just had an election. If you want to get down about the election or you want to get up about the election, remember the way they had to live, okay? There's a two-part system under Roman authority. By Roman concession, the Jews were subject to their Jewish laws and their Jewish authorities. But also, all Jews were subject to Roman laws and Roman authorities, you're like, goodness, what is going on here? Well, if a Jew was accused of violating Jewish law, then they were to be persecuted by Jewish authorities. If a Jew was accused of violating Roman law, then they were subject to the Roman system. And only, 
only the Roman system had the right of the sword. That is the right to condemn a person to death. Because why? They were the bosses. They were the bosses. So they were under two systems. In this case, the charge brought against Jesus was violation of the Jewish law. So the Roman cohort is acting on behalf of the Jewish authorities when they arrest Jesus. They deliver him to the Jewish authorities for trial. And what a mess this trial is. Making the situation more still confusing is under the, uh, the Jewish law, there are two authorities at this time. There are two high priests. Two, you say, well, how does that happen? Who is the high priest? Is it Annas? Is it Caiaphas? Who is it? Well, a little background helps you understand this. Look at number, letter B, the assembly. The assembly. The assembly. Jesus is taken first to Annas, who had influence over Jewish religious affairs and was an informal authority. All right. Verse 13 says, and led him, that's Jesus, away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. Okay. Now get this. It's a background so you understand this. Annas had been appointed to the office of high priest by the governor of Syria in AD 6. In AD 6. About the time Judea was incorporated into the Roman Empire as a minor province. Annas was then removed in AD 15. That's just nine years ago uh, after this by the prefect of Judea. A skillful manipulator, Annas then exercised power through the members of his family, and it was he who actually ran the high priesthood as head of the Sadducean party. This is what happened, and this will make sense to you after you understand this. Annas was the head dog. He was the head high priest. Okay? He had five grandsons. He had five, no, I'm sorry, he had five sons and a grandson, and then he had also a son-in-law named Caiaphas. Watch this. He was very shrewd. He was deposed. He was removed from being the high priest, but five of his sons in a row became the high priest, one right after another, and they were put in that place by whom? By the Romans. Understand this. And then the grandson, the grandson was the last one, the sixth one. He became a high priest, and then he was removed, and who was put in his place? Caiaphas, the son-in-law. All tied to who? Annas. So you think your government's messed up. All tied to Annas. And Annas had major power. Because why? Because the Jewish people knew when you became high priest, the only way that you could be taken out is if you died. So Annas is alive at this time. He's approximately 60 years old. He is the high priest behind the scenes. But up front... The figure is Caiaphas, his son-in-law. Okay? So you think you have problems with your father-in-law. You think about Caiaphas and his father-in-law and what's going on. Okay? So, so I hope that helps you understand the context of what's going on. Finally, Annas' son-in-law, Caiaphas, was named high priest. And Caiaphas seemed to have been open to Roman oversight since he held the position for several decades. So he did whatever they wanted him to do. He worked very well with the Roman uh, authorities. Since the Romans ruled the land, the people of Israel still recognized Annas as the rightful high priest. Since the law of Moses stated that a high priest serves for life. Therefore, when it came time to try Jesus, they sent Jesus off to who? Annas. Why? Because he's the most powerful high priest. And he's being tried under Jewish law and Jewish authority. Go like this if you kind of understand what I'm doing. If you don't, just raise your hand and say, man, what are you talking about? This is what's going on. Because when you read this, you're like, well, who's who and what's going on? So you have this, and it'll be clear to you. Therefore, when they did come, uh, the first opportunity to pass judgment upon Jesus, they brought him to Annas. Only John records the details of Annas' trial. 
the Gospel of John. And on the other hand, John gives no attention to the trial before Caiaphas, nor does John address the subsequent trial in front of the Jewish ruling council called the Sanhedrin. Where are you going to find that at? Matthew, Mark, and Luke. So you remember, you've got four different pictures here, and you're taking a picture of what's going on. John's just giving you what you need to know to understand that what? Jesus is the Son of God. He's God himself in the flesh. Okay? Understand? Okay, take a deep breath. Okay, I just want you to understand that. Because going forward, then you understand, okay, who are these people and why are they doing what they're doing? This highlights the irony. Those who had spiritual oversight were leading the sinless one to trial. You talk about the greatest irony. These quote-unquote religious folks are putting to trial the one who's never sinned. And it's the greatest irony of all. Secondly, you, uh, thirdly, you see the agenda. The agenda. All right, the agenda. It was Caiaphas who prophetically declared that Jesus needed to die for the sake of the Jewish nation, not realizing the full meaning of his words. You say, where do you see this at? Go in your Bible back to John 11. Okay, we're in John 18. Go back seven chapters to John 11, and we're going to read this, and, you'll, and it'll clear up things for you. John 11, verse 45 and following. John 11, verse 45 says, Then many of the Jews which came to Mary and had seen the things which Jesus did believed on him. But some of them went their ways to the Pharisees and told them what things Jesus had done. Then gathered the chief priest and the Pharisees a council and said, What do we? For this man doeth many miracles. If we let him thus alone, all will believe on him. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. Verse 49, And one of them named Caiaphas. Being the high priest that same year, said unto them, Ye know nothing at all, nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people, and that the whole nation perish not. And this spake he not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for that nation, and not for that nation only but that also he should gather together in one the children of God that were scattered abroad. Look at verse 53. Then from that day forth, they took counsel together for to put him to death. Don't forget that. They had one thing on their mind. We are going to kill him. We're going to kill him. John restates this to remind his readers that Jesus was about to be tried by those who had already decided the outcome of the trial. Now look at verse 14. Now Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. This literally foreshadows the unjust proceedings that were to become concerning their wicked agenda. So now you have the captivity of Christ. And if you want to say, man, that's not fair, you're exactly right. It's not fair. You're exactly right. It's totally wicked and totally wrong. Secondly, you see this, the courage commit, uh, commitment of Christ. The courageous commitment of Christ. And this is beautiful what he does. First of all, the questioning. The questioning. The high priest questions Jesus about his disciples and his doctrine. This is totally illegal. And if you don't understand this, when you get right there, you say, wait a minute, this is totally wrong. Hey, you're exactly right. It's totally wrong. Totally. So what's he do? Jesus responds with calm clarity, highlighting the openness of his teachings and rejecting any secrecy. So what's he say? Look at verse 19. The high priest then asked Jesus of his disciples and of his doctrine. All of Jesus' trials were little more than kangaroo courts. And you see this. There were many, many violations of Jewish law committed by the Jewish authorities in the conduct of all of these trials. Basically, any rule they needed to ignore, any rule that they wanted to bypass, they did in order to arrive at the verdict that they already had decided. The entire proceedings were contrived to arrive at a certain conviction. And Annas 
Annas, the old man high priest, was looking for something on which to build a case. The entire proceeding was illegal. Demanding that Jesus incriminate himself was against the law of Jewish justice. And under Jewish law, a defendant was not required to admit any guilt. Therefore, the Jewish trial of Jesus was a mockery of justice. I just will put out four things here that you need to understand and be very helpful to you. First of all, they had hastily assembled the court at night, but it was illegal to try cases at night. All criminals had to be tried in the day. To understand this, this is totally against the law, their law. They secondly were meeting in Annas' palace, home, not in the official court. This too was illegal. All cases had to be tried in court. Number three, Jesus was being tried during the Passover week, but no cases were supposed to be tried during that week. Absolutely none. And fourthly, the leaders had not met to try Jesus, but to secretly uh, devise charges and to condemn him to death. Totally illegal, everything that they're doing. And any lawyer, anybody that's in law knows exactly this is wrong. That's why a lot of folks that try to prove that Jesus never died and never resurrected, when they go through these trials, they're like, it's true. He really did give his life. Because they did everything illegal against him. And yet what? He still laid down his life. And watch this. He's still in control. See, that's what we struggle with is the fact that Hey, if it's totally illegal and he's all powerful, why doesn't he just knock them down? Because that's the whole point. Jesus came to give his life for us. Didn't make a difference that we are illegally going to do it. It had made no difference. He's in total control of everything going on. And by the way, friend, he's still in control today in 2024. He's never lost control. Never all, never once. Not once. And so the first part of the question had to do with the Lord's disciples. I mean, think about this. What did the high priest want to know about them? And how many were there? What kind of threat did they pose? The Lord, the Lord ignored the question. He determined to shield them. They were no threat to the establishment. They were, for the most part, totally disorganized and totally demoralized right now. Their leader, who they thought was going to turn things around, he's not doing exactly what they thought he was going to do. And so Jesus, one of them, Peter, would repeatedly deny him right outside in the court. And the high priest already had Judas in his pocket. There was no conspiracy. And as for Jesus' doctrine, well, there's no secret about that. He's been up front and public about everything. So think about this. You see, first, the questioning, but second, the courageous confession. The courageous confession. Jesus openly declares that his teachings were public resisting the manipulation of the religious leaders. His commitment to truth in the face of falsehood contrasts sharply with the duplicity of his accusers. They were doing everything backwards, and they were trying their best to put him in the corner. And so we read in verse 20 and 21, Jesus answered him, I spake openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple, whither the Jews always resort. Who's he in front of? This is a Jewish trial. So I, I've done this all openly in front of the synagogue, in front of the temple. I, I've not done anything behind the scenes. I've been upfront about all of this. What I have said unto them, behold, they know what I said. Once again, Jesus is in control of the circumstances. And so they go forward despite the ridiculousness of the charges. And when Annas asks Jesus what he's been teaching, Jesus responds by challenging Annas to explain why he would ask Jesus to repeat things that had been said publicly. Jesus' point is that Annas is clearly on a fishing expedition. And he's wanting to get him to say something so that he can take his words and turn them. 
Annas knows what Jesus was teaching, and he has asked Jesus to repeat himself so that something in his words might be used against him. Furthermore, Jesus is challenging them on the point of Jewish law. Man, this, is, this is interesting. The lawgiver himself is saying, hey, folks, this is your law. This is the law that you've come up with. So listen to what you're saying. Since an accused was not permitted by Jewish law to testify against himself. So Jesus is pointing out Annas' violation of law and interrogating the accused. Oh, by the way, where's Annas getting all of his money? Annas is getting all of his money because he's over all of the temple. Watch this. What's going on? What's getting ready to go on? Passover. Thank you, Stan. You say, what's the big deal? This is the big deal. He knew who Jesus was, and he knew all along who Jesus was. Because why? He got hit in his money bag. Ever got hit in your money bag? It gets your attention, doesn't it? When you get your wallet stolen, and you get something stolen out of your wallet from somebody, you say, you know what? You got my attention now. I, I'm ready to listen to you. You see, Jesus went in, and what do you remember he did in the temple? I, I say it this way for a cliff note version. He tore down Walmart. He took down Walmart that was going on in the temple. Because they were what? They were making ridiculous money. So you bring the sheep that you have and the lamb that you have, and I want you to bring it to me. Because it's got to be approved by us at the temple. And by the way, when you bring it, it will not measure up. So you're going to have to get another one. And when you do get another one, guess what you're going to have to do? You're going to have to use the temple money. you got to be kidding me. Nope. So everybody's getting involved in what? Making money. Who's at the top of that pyramid? The guy named Annas. Do you think he knew who Jesus was? This dude's been a cog in my wheel. And I don't like him at all. And I want to put the screws to him because what he's done to me. Now, while you're thinking about that, have you had a similar conversation with God about that? And what he's done in your life? This is what it looks like usually. God, if you really are who you say you are, I don't have a child here anymore. If you remember, buddy, I prayed out to you that you would save them. And you didn't. Therefore, I don't trust you. You're not who you say you are. God has never changed because there's no need for him to change. And he is gracious by allowing things to happen in our life. I've got two kids in heaven today that I've never seen. And trust me, Amy and I prayed for both of them to live. But they're with him. I guarantee if you ask both of them, they'll say, boy, it's a lot better to be up here, Dad, than it is to be with you down there. Problem is, we are God, and he is. And he loves you, and he loves me. And he wants us to see what he's doing and what he has done for us so that what? We turn our eyes off of us and turn our eyes upon him because he's worthy. He's worthy. And there's no denying the love that he has for us. Thirdly, the condemnation. The condemnation. Jesus is struck by one of the officers for responding to the high priest truthfully. Yet, he remains poised, not retaliating, but questioning the justice of the act. 
You see, he embodies calm endurance under wrongful accusation. Standing as the faithful witness. Look at verse 22. And when he had thus spoken, one of the officers which stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Answerest thou the high priest so? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil, but if well, why smitest thou me? Now Annas had sent him bound unto Caiaphas the high priest. This is a picture of how the world mistreats Jesus. Throughout his whole ministry, Jesus had insisted time and time again that he was actually the revelation of God. He was the son of God. And yet the world shut its ears and reacted. It wanted nothing to disturb it, not even its only religion. And it wanted no rebuttal and no other answer given to the high priest of its religion. Too often, we respond the same way. Shutting our ears and our mind to the truth, the living truth, the very Son of God himself. Thirdly, and this is the contrast, thirdly, the collapse of courage in Peter. The collapse of courage in Peter. First of all, we see the denial's descent. The denial's descent. Peter is on a descent downward. Because why? He's denying who God is. He's denying who Jesus is. He's denying his relationship. He's denying everything that he does not need to deny. And if you just step back and understand the picture that's going on here, Peter, this is a girl who's watching the door. And Peter... You're going to let her intimidate you? I mean, come on. What? This doesn't make sense, Peter, what you're doing. And so watch what happens. Peter, who initially follows Jesus, is soon intimidated by a servant girl and others leading him to deny even knowing Jesus. And this marks the beginning of his downward spiral. Look at verse 15. And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. That disciple was known unto the high priest and went in with Jesus into the palace of the high priest. But Peter stood at the door without. Then went out that other disciple, which was known unto the high priest, and spake unto her that kept the door and brought in Peter. Then saith the damsel of, that kept the door unto Peter, Art, now thou, art not thou one of his, this man's disciples? He said, I am not. And the servants and officers stood there who had made a fire of coals, for it was cold, and they warmed themselves, and Peter stood with them and warmed himself. Peter stood with the very enemies of God and warmed himself right with them. You see, as Jesus is sent to Annas' house, Peter followed Jesus at a distance, and naturally, he's curious of what will happen to Jesus. But Peter is also worried. Why? He knows that if his rabbi is arrested by the Jewish authorities, then Jesus' disciples would be next on the list. So he attempts to what? Blend into the crowd. Just blend in and not be different, and not take a stand. Another disciple was more bold than Peter, you remember? It says another disciple. There's a lot of argument about who that is. I believe it is John, the writer of the gospel. There's other people that believe it's Nicodemus. There's other people that say, think it is Joseph of Arimathea. I believe it's John, and, but that's okay. I could be wrong, but that's totally fine. It won't change what happens. But to understand this, Peter uh, most believed this disciple was John since he often refers to himself in the third person as well as without name. You remember we said this at the very beginning. All throughout the book, John never mentions his name. 
He never, he, he never mentions his name. Furthermore, John's mother, Salome, was a sister of Mary, the mother of Jesus. Here's how I draw this. So John was both a cousin of Jesus as well as a nephew of Zechariah and Elizabeth, the parents of who? John the Baptist. All right? So Zechariah was a priest who served in the temple, so it's not impossible for John to have a relationship with a high priest named Annas. And I believe that's exactly what it's showing in verse 15. But John's focus is on Peter's denial. John records this scene in a similar manner to the other Gospels, alternating between Jesus and between Peter. So you see this, Jesus does the faithful thing, Peter denies. Here Jesus is standing up for the truth, Peter's denying again. And so you see this back and forth. The contrast is between Jesus speaking with knowing it will result in the loss of his earthly life, while Peter lies to protect his earthly life. And John eventually gets permission to bring Peter into the courtyard of the house. That's what's outstanding about it. This other disciple says, hey, by the way, I know this. Just let him in. I know that he, just let him in. Let Peter in. Peter gets to the door, and Joanna can be the damsel. Joanna's just sitting there going, didn't I see you? And what's Peter do? He stops. Doesn't go in. No, I don't know him. I don't know him at all. Peter, you just took off the ear of Malchus just a few minutes ago. Just a few minutes ago, you took your whoop. And now some girl is saying, weren't you with them? I, I, nope, not me. I'm not. I don't know them. Not at all. And you see the downward spiral. It starts by what? Just a little temptation to choose to do what is wrong. It's just a little damsel that's asking an innocent question. And what's he do? He takes it to the wrong way. I know you've never done that. Somebody said something to you and you took it, and oh, they know it all now, and I, I don't. Aren't we guilty of that? This is why, when you look at Peter in the story, you're like, oh my, this is me, this is me, this is me, this is me, this is me. That's the whole point Jesus is making. You can be like Peter, but don't finish like Peter. Don't quit, but go on like Peter and repent of your sin and get right and do what you need to for God. That's the great, great, great advantage we have as believers. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. And so he's there for a reason, and he wants you to know who he is. And he's not going to leave you alone. So understand, his denial just keeps going down and down. Secondly, you see the repeated renouncement. We're almost done. Peter's second and third denials influenced by fear and sense of self-preservation show a gradual collapse under pressure. Despite being questioned by those with no authority to harm him, his courage falters. I mean, this damsel didn't even have a sword or anything. Like, well, she couldn't do anything. She's just watching the door. And he just cowers down. And so, verse 25, And Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. They said therefore unto him, Art not thou also one of his disciples? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, being his kinsman, whose ear Peter cut off, saith, Did not I see thee in the garden with him? Peter had joined the crowd, attempting to become one of them. And when asked about Jesus, he denied his separation from the world. I am not a disciple of his. I'm one of you. I'm just like you. I'm just here, just curious about what's going on. I'm, I'm just standing by. 
Too many believers fear. And because of that fear, they lose their testimony for Christ and the opportunity to witness and to win others for Jesus. Too many fear embarrassment. Too many fear ridicule. Loss of a position. Loss of a worldly neighbor. You fear loss of any power that you might have. Loss of promotion. Paul tells Timothy, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Moses said this in Deuteronomy 31, 6, Be strong and of a good courage, fear not, nor be afraid of them. Why? For the Lord thy God, he it is that doth go with thee, he will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. In the face of repeated renouncement, Jesus is right there for Peter. Thirdly and finally, the crushing conclusion. The crushing conclusion. And every single person here that has done wrong and saw the eyes of their father looking through the rear view mirror of the car knows exactly how this feels. Peter's third denial, the rooster crows fulfilling Jesus' prophecy and reminding Peter of his weakness. It says, Peter then denied again, and immediately the cock crew. We know from the other Gospels, when he denied Christ, he looked up, and Jesus looked right at him in his eyes. And you know how that feeling is. I am wrong. You are right. Man, I messed up and I'm sorry. Jesus looks at him as Jesus is being led away. And Peter knew exactly. And the gospel tells us that he went out and he wept bitterly. And he repented and he got right. And we'll see this at the end of the book of John. But I want you to know, friend, that's the conclusion when we don't stand up and say, I am his and he is mine. And it can be the simplest places. You may be traveling and you just, something happens and somebody asks you and you say, I don't want to be put on the spot. I'll just move on. <laughs> Do we recognize that Jesus Christ has never missed a nanosecond of our life? He's never missed what we have said. He's never missed what we have done. And this is the most sobering thing. He's never missed our motive. As to why we've done what we've done and why we're thinking the way we're thinking. And I just want you to know, friend, God knows everything about you and me and he still loves you and me. He still wants you to know that he loves you and me. And we can get forgiveness and that forgiveness comes by asking and receiving. You asked him to forgive you, and he promises, I will forgive you. And he, by the way, is the only one that truly has the power to forgive completely. And when he does, this is an awesome thing. He never brings it back up. I know we have a problem sometimes between one another that we'll say, yeah, I forgive you, and then well, we, we bring it back up the next time. Do you know Jesus never brings it back up? Never. Because why? He says, I paid for it fully. It's gone. It's in the past. Now let's move on. Because we have a great future ahead of us together. Amen. Look at what Jesus has done. 
And he gives us Peter as the example to say, hey, you, you may have failed, but you can be right with me. And I beg of you, be right with him. <laughs>